Hey, folks. Uh, my name is Catherine Grayson Nans, and I'm the developer advocate for Kendo React at Progress. But that actually is not what I always plan to be doing. In fact, I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in Studio Arts. I went to school to become a graphic designer, and I did. I worked in ad agencies for several years afterwards. I could probably fill a whole nother talk just talking about the experience of moving from design into development, but I really only bring it up here today to tell you why I'm up here talking about design. With that experience, I've gotten to see firsthand the way that so many developers really struggle with design. This could be difficulty collaborating with their design team or frustration when trying to work on an app or a side project of their own, or even just those kind of small design decisions that often slip through the cracks and end up becoming a developer's problem. When you don't know much about design, every single choice can feel overwhelming. I can't count the number of times I've had a developer come up to me and say, it just doesn't look right, or I can't make it look professional. They can identify that there is something wrong, but they can't figure out why. It's like trying to solve a riddle in a whole other language. The problem itself is one thing, but they don't even have the words to describe it. And that's really what I'm hoping to offer you here, is a kind of Rosetta Stone for understanding the world of design by learning some of the fundamentals. Enough knowledge for you to be able to identify what's happening in your designs and why. But first, there's a common myth about design that I need to debunk before we go any further. That is this assumption that you have to have an eye for design. It's something you're just born with, and you have it or you don't, and I'll stop you right there and tell you that is bullshit. Design is a science. It's based on what we know about how our eyes and our brains process the world. And once you have a grasp of those fundamentals, then you can create designs that naturally align with how humans interpret information. Or, as we call them in the biz, good designs. That said, it's probably time to start doing some of that learning, right? So let's get into it. Welcome to Foundations of Design. Today, we will be talking through the basics of color, layout, and typography. I'll be your professor, and I promise it will be less painful than the art history classes I had to take in college. And you don't have to sit on those really weird, terrible metal stools that they put in every art classroom for no reason. So you've already got that going for you. First things first, color. Color is complex, because the way we perceive and interpret a color is based entirely on the other colors around it. For example, at first glance, these two squares might seem to be different colors. But in truth, the two smaller squares are exactly the same color. Depending on which background color it's paired with, our eyes will perceive the color differently. Having this contextual awareness is huge when it comes to our interfaces. Because a color that looks one way in isolation will look completely different when it's put into a layout with other colors. In fact, that's where people often struggle most, creating color schemes. But in order to talk about color schemes, we first need to take a step back and talk about the color wheel. Chances are you have seen a color wheel before at some point, even if it was just this one. <laughs> this, however, is the much more pleasant Johannes Eaton color wheel, which does a great job of demonstrating the relationship between colors. When you combine primary colors, that's the red, yellow, and blue there at the center, you get a secondary color, orange, green, or purple. Mixing a secondary color back with a primary color results in a tertiary color, which you can see along the outer ring. In this way, every color can be made by combining those three primary colors. Now, when we're talking about a color's actual color, we're talking about its hue. That's the thing that makes us describe a color as green as opposed to red or blue. But hue is really only one half of a color. There's also value. Value is the lightness or darkness of the hue. It's the difference between sky blue or navy. You can change the value of a color in three ways, by adding white to create a tint, adding gray to create a tone, or adding black to create a shade. The color wheel can also be divided into two halves, warm and cool colors. Warm colors are your reds, your oranges, your yellows, stuff that evoke feelings of warmth and sunlight, whereas your cool colors will be blues, greens, and purples, things we associate with feelings of coolness or of night. 
we extend these warm and cool feelings into their connected emotions. So warm colors kind of feel happy and energizing and vibrant, whereas cooler colors feel a little bit more somber. They're associated with steadiness, relaxation, knowledge. When we understand the color wheel, we have a tool to visualize the relationship that colors have with each other, and we can use that to know in advance which colors will work well together and which won't. When choosing colors, I recommend one of using one of these four basic color schemes as your starting point. The first is the simplest, monochromatic. It uses the tints, tones, and shades of only one hue. It's easy because you only need that one color, but the downside is you might feel a little bit of a lack of variety while you're working. This painting, Mark Tanzi's Forward Retreat, is a great example of using a monochromatic color scheme to create intensity. It's because repeated elements create a kind of emphasis, like when you write something and then underline it several times, or repeat words while you're speaking, like, no, I really, really mean it. Repetition is a tool that we can use in multiple ways to tell the user, no, pay attention to this. This is important. And of course, if we're talking about monochromatic UIs, we gotta talk about Facebook. Facebook is blue, 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 and we only very occasionally see other colors in the case of errors or informational warnings. A similar color scheme is analogous, which uses colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. This is my recommendation for people who are complete design newbies, because like monochromatic screen schemes, they are intuitive and they are hard to mess up, but they also have the advantage of giving you a few more colors to play with, so you really get the best of both worlds. In the wild, a good example of an analogous color scheme is BP. You get green, yellow, green, and yellow, stretches right across that section of the color wheel like a perfect arc. Now we start to branch across the wheel. Complementary color schemes use colors that are exactly opposite each other. Orange and blue is one that's especially common, uh, like in movie posters, as you can see here. And as a UI example, let's look at Amazon. Amazon has this orange logo, but Orange is actually a really hard color to use in interfaces. It's difficult to make it accessible. It often feels too bright and too loud if you use too much of it. So here they've opted for a complementary scheme, which allows them to include their brand orange without making it the main event. Design-wise, it's a really smart and practical trick. And if you ever find yourself struggling to design around a difficult color, maybe try looking across the wheel. Last on our list is triadic. This color scheme has three main colors, equally spaced from each other, that create a triangle across the color wheel. Vermeer's girl with the pearl earring here uses this color scheme. You can see with her red lips, her blue wrap, and the yellow clothing. In a less fine art example, we can take a look at the Pepsi website. Yellow is not one of their official brand colors, but you can tell that someone here knew their color theory because yellow is very naturally incorporated in all their photos and their accent colors, and it really brings the whole design together. All right, now that we've talked a little about colors, let's start talking about the actual elements on your page, which means we need to talk about brains. <laughs> There's still a lot that we don't know about the human brain, but one of the things that we do know is that our brains love to categorize things. It's how we try to make sense of the absolute deluge of sensory input that we get every single day. And when we look at a design, we attempt to organize the elements on the page so that we can digest the content. When we've designed a layout that doesn't look good or right, it's often because we're unintentionally working against those organizational methods. Working with them makes our designs more intuitive. And like color, there are principles of layout that you can use in order to align your work with how the brain organizes stuff. One of the most popular of these is Gestalt theory, which identifies six main patterns or principles that we use to group and make sense of information. These make a little more sense with some examples, so let's take a look. Similarity means that we assume an association between similar elements. For example, here our brains will organize these shapes into horizontal lines because the shapes and colors are the same horizontally, so we assume there must be a relationship. We don't see them as columns, we see them as rows. Closure means that we will try to fill in the missing gaps or spaces. So here we see a square and a diamond, despite the fact that there's not a square or a diamond actually present, just these weird little Pac-Man wedge things. We've inferred the square and the diamond by mentally closing the gaps. Continuity means that the viewer's eye will continue along the same unbroken path unless it is actively interrupted. 
It's kind of similar to closure in that both have to do with how the eye moves and following that invisible line. But while closure has to do with the creation of that line itself, continuity has to do with when that line is interrupted and when it's not. Proximity means that we naturally group items that are placed closely together. For example, here, we'll group the two left-hand elements into a single vertical column because they're closer to each other than they are to the right-hand element. Figure ground is interesting because it refers to our attempt to impose our 3D understanding of the world onto 2D objects and designs. Because we, as humans, are used to functioning in three dimensions with a sense of depth, we very naturally identify things that are closer to us as being more important, more immediately relevant, and therefore the subject, or the figure, while everything else is the background. Finally, symmetry captures our natural sense of balance. We want things to feel equal. When they don't, it can feel kind of unsettling and off-putting. Symmetry does not always have to be perfectly exact, the way that this example is, but it does mean that we'll seek out and feel reassured by visual balance in designs. We'll talk more about balance in just a minute. But now that we have an understanding of why and how our brains attempt to organize things, we can combine that knowledge with visual hierarchy to create interfaces that capture and direct our user's attention. Visual hierarchy is the practice of creating contrast in your design by combining the use of size, placement, and color to manipulate the visual weight of each element and make your most important elements stand out. Size is the fastest and easiest way to create a hierarchy. When you make one element much larger than the others, a viewer's eye will begin there, almost regardless of anything else on the page. Take a look at this in action. Now, I do feel obligated to begin by saying that word clouds are not a great design. Don't use them. <laughs> However, they are an excellent example of this concept, because our eyes are immediately drawn to the word education. A good rule of thumb here is to make your most important element the largest, and then set the size of your other elements relative to that based on uh, relevance of importance. Another way to create hierarchy is to put your most important items at the top, and then work your way down in order of prioritization, like a newspaper. As you can see here, the most crucial information is at the top, our logo and our headline, and then the text gets smaller as you move down the page, combining size and placement to indicate relative importance. The last piece of the visual hierarchy puzzle is color. Color is a little different since, as we said before, how it's interpreted depends on the colors around it. And as you can see here, the contrast in value between the background color and the color of your element is what determines its visual weight and therefore its place in the hierarchy. Now that we know how to manipulate visual weight of elements, the next step is understanding how to evenly distribute that weight across your composition using balance. Because humans had to master balance in order to stand upright, avoid danger, build stable structures, we have a very strong association with balance and safety and comfort. Looking at unbalanced things makes us feel uneasy or tense. Sometimes we really wanna fix it, like when you're looking at a photo frame that's hanging just wrong on the wall. And we don't want that feeling when people look at our interfaces. Visual balance works pretty much the same way that physical balance does. Elements need to be equally weighted on either side of a center axis. If you imagine the halves of your design like a seesaw or a set of scales, it might help you visualize it. So looking here, which side of this would you say is visually heavier, the left or the right? If you guessed left, you would be correct. <laughs> Even though the squares are the same shape and the same color, the larger size, that's on the right over here, isn't it? It's mirrored. That worked out well for me. The large square is the side with the heavier visual weight. <laughs> and it makes this image feel off-center, even though it technically is not. <laughs> the easiest way to create balance is through symmetry, which is perfectly mirroring two sides of a design. This can give your designs a feeling of strength, permanence, and stability. It's often used when you want to communicate that something is luxury or very calming, uh, yeah, very stable and traditional. But balance does not always have to be perfectly symmetrical. It just means that your element's visual weights are roughly equivalent. Asymmetrical balance is what you'll see most often in web and UI design, because perfectly symmetrical design is beautiful, but also kind of impractical. You don't always get UI elements in perfect matched sets. A really common example of this asymmetrical design pattern is the text image balance that you'll see on a lot of kind of home pages. 
but you can also create asymmetrical balance through placement. Large items near the middle of a composition can be balanced by smaller items near the edge, and in UI design, we see this a lot with sidebars. Thus far, we've been really focused on the things that you're adding to the page, but the other equally, if not more important part, is where you don't put anything at all, the white space. White space gives our eyes a place to rest and our minds a chance to process. It's how you can group or separate elements to create associations or prevent them. It's really easy to get carried away when you're designing. In fact, I would say it's one of the most common mistakes that especially beginning designers will make. You have this feeling like, all right, I started with a blank page and it's my job to fill it, right? So you just keep putting stuff on it. <laughs> but it's important to remember that every single element on your page in a design should be serving a purpose. And if you don't have enough white space, it's likely because you have things in your design that aren't actually doing anything to further your goal or communicate your message. They're just kind of creating visual clutter. Finally, our last topic, typography. Type is powerful. We learn to read at a very young age, and from then on, we're really immersed in the world of type. Because of this, pretty much anyone can recognize bad type. After all, the goal is for you to read it. If you can't read it, it's a bad design. <laughs> the question, as always, is the opposite. How do we create type that looks good? Typography is a world all its own, so we should really start with a quick history lesson. Typography, the way that we think about it today, the printing of letters by a machine, not by hand, begins with the printing press and metal movable type. Early movable type systems using clay and wood were found in China as early as 1088, but movable type didn't really catch on until 1440, when Johannes Gutenberg invented his printing press in Germany using a similar system of metal character blocks and the much more limited Germanic language characters. This printing press is important to be aware of because it was the origin of the art of typesetting. And the foundations of that are still very much in use today. Most typography terms, in fact, are based on this system, so it's really helpful to keep it in mind as we talk through some basics. A character is any single element. It could be a letter, a punctuation mark, a number. Thinking back to that movable type system, a character would be any single block of metal type. A typeface is a collection of characters in a specific style. You already know them, you work with them all the time. Times New Roman, Bodoni, Helvetica, Calibri, whatever's the default in Microsoft Word now. <laughs> There's a thousand of them. A font, on the other hand, is a very specific version of a typeface. Font and typeface are words that are often used interchangeably, but they're not actually the same. So now you can become that um actually guy in your office. <laughs> For example, uh, Futura is a typeface, but Futura condensed would be a font, and Futura bold would be a font. Kerning is the space between two characters. Sometimes you'll want to give characters a little more or less breathing room. If you neglect it, that can create gaps in words where you might not have wanted it, like in this example, or you could run words together that makes them more difficult to read. Tracking is similar to kerning. It's another couple of words that get regularly confused. But while kerning refers specifically to the spacing between two characters, tracking is a consistent amount of spacing between all the characters. CSS devs will know it better as letter spacing. Letting is the vertical space between lines of text. Originally, this term comes from the actual lead strips that were used to separate lines of characters when you were setting type by hand, but you might know it better as line height. It's a little thing that really makes a big difference, and it's a good way to sneak in a little extra white space. This very random group of words are all ways to describe various issues that can arise with how your text is laid out. Widows happen when the last line of text gets separated from the rest of its related paragraph, usually by a page break or a column wrap in UI design. An orphan, on the other hand, is the reverse. That's when the first line gets separated from the rest. And then runts are those scraggly little last words that wrap onto the next line all by themselves. Removing all of these from your text will make it easier to read. You might have thought, dash is a dash is a dash, right? It's where you'd be wrong, because there are, in fact, three different types of dashes. They all have different widths, and they're used for different purposes. The hyphen is used, obviously, to hyphenate multi-part words, like mother-in-law or front-end. Then there's an n-dash, which is used to show ranges in numbers and dates, like June 10th to 20th. 
And finally, the M dash used to separate thoughts in a sentence like this. The N and M terms come from the width of the characters. So an N dash will always be the same width as the character N in that typeface, and an M dash will always be the same width as your M. Now that you know some basic terms, some things to look out for, let's talk about choosing a typeface, something that's hard for even the most seasoned of designers. There are many categories and subcategories of typefaces based on their style, their usage, their historical context, but here are four of the most common and what they're best used for. Serifs are those small decorative lines that are found on characters, usually at the top and the bottom. They'll confer a more professional, kind of old school feeling to your type, and they're often associated with tradition and legacy. They're good for conveying authority, expertise, and trustworthiness. If you're gonna be setting large blocks of type, like a blog article or an ebook, a serif font is gonna be ideal. The serifs create a more noticeable differentiation between your characters, which makes them easier to read. Working in tech, you have absolutely seen a sans serif font. <laughs> Thanks to their very clean and modern look, they've become really ubiquitous in this industry. They're a great choice for communicating youth, friendliness, modernity, or technology. Display typefaces are a little bit funky, a little bit weird. They're distinctive, but to the detriment of their readability. They should be used, but with caution. They'll add a huge burst of personality to your design, a lot of fun, but they also call a large amount of attention and require a pretty big font size. And script typefaces mimic handwriting. These will add a lot of humanity to your design. They're often used to communicate that something is homemade or artisan or otherwise very thoughtfully done. You wouldn't want to use a script font for your body text, but you might be able to use it for subheaders or other small blocks of text. All right, folks, I raced through that and we covered a lot today in not a lot of time. This was kind of a speed run through my whole first year of college, really. <laughs> but hopefully it provided you enough insight to start to get a feel for how and why design decisions are made. It's not just random guessing, it's not trying things until they look right. Design is a science-based approach to putting elements on the page in a way that we've learned can evoke the emotional response that we're looking for. Design is powerful, and when we're leveraging these tools for our applications or our websites, we can make a huge positive difference in the user experience. Knowing these foundations puts you in a strong position for both creating your own designs and collaborating with any designers you might work with. Just make sure that you're only using your powers for good, all right, not for evil. At least, mostly not for evil. A little evil sounds fun, but just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> Thank you.